books, and we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, a very important scripture since it warns us about the days we are living in right now. Title of my message today is Devils Behind Darwin, the Satanic History of Evolution. Let me give you my text. This know also, 2 Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Keep that in your mind. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I pray we're not of that number. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's our text. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy Father, bless us in the name of the Lord Jesus to apply this text properly by your Holy Spirit. And we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving your word. We thank you for all who hear this sermon and pray, God, that you would please help us in these last days to be kept from error. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. I want you to notice we have the last days here. Israel is a nation now. You have Mark of the Beast technology. You have earthquakes everywhere. You have a falling away of many Christians eating and drinking with the drunkard, uh, with, the, with, with the drunken. So we have a situation that is right here in our Bible. The last generation, I believe. Now, what you do see is, verse 8, a warning about sorcerers. Janice and Jambres were obviously the two witches, wizards, magicians that withstood Moses. So what you're going to have in the last days is people opposing the truth of God, just like those two wizards opposed the truth of Moses. And I'm going to tell you what I believe this shows is that we're going to have not just a resisting of the truth, but we're going to have a resisting of the truth with magic, with witchcraft, with sorcery. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. The deceptions will grow bigger. The number of those deceived will grow. So what are we to do in this situation? Verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. So obviously the devil's going to come to try to keep you from proving anything. He's going to say, don't prove anything. Uh, Don't think. Uh, Don't worry about um, whether you've proved something or not. And notice the key to this is knowing of whom thou has learned them. And where does this doctrine come from? Who was the originator of the doctrine? Who is the founder of this doctrine? And that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. In other words, the point is, go back to what God has given us. Go back to the Holy Scriptures, the revelation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of who? God. Now what this means is, the Holy Scriptures are inspired of God. This means you need to watch out for the devil's inspiration. Just as he had Janice and Jambres, he's going to have sorcerers in the last days, and they are going to be inspired. They will be inspired. Just not inspired of God, right? Give me a little more, my dear brother, because I'm going to tell you something. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4. I'm going to show you how the devil is going to inspire some in the last days. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, same time we're dealing with, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Who's inspiring these people? The devil. The devil. There's going to be doctrines of devils that originated from these seducing spirits. So here you have the contrast. Inspired of God, watch out for the sorcerers, 
Make sure you know where the doctrine has come from and beware the Spirit speaks expressly that there's going to be doctrines that originated by devils. First Timothy 6, O Timothy, and it's a word to every pastor in the world and really every Christian in general, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. What a prophetic word that is which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now that we are at the start of this Gentile New Year, I thought it would be timely to just get down to some foundations, some basics of things. Uh, I want to explore further the foundations of modern deception. We've been dealing with propaganda and the way the devil deceives Christians and really all of the world. And so we want to get down to the foundations of these deceptions. There's a book that was written in 1935, very good book. You can find it online probably. Uh, Dan Gilbert's Evolution, The Root of All Isms. Very, very enlightening book showing how they brought into colleges psychology all across America. And they told a bunch of college kids, uh, young men and women, that if monkeys do it, you can do it. And so therefore, let's sit and watch monkeys in a cage, and if they do it, you can do it. And basically, uh, if they pick their nose, it's all right for you to pick yours in public, and all of that type of thing, and even worse things, obviously. And uh, basically, Dan Gilbert shows that the root of all the bad isms is evolution. And I believe this is true, though I believe there are some pillars likely underneath evolution. So I would say it is not the root. I would say it is a root. Um, we can begin to discern some satanic patterns in history. When the Assyrians in the days of Hezekiah tried to discourage Judah, see, the devil wants to discourage you. The devil wants to discourage you. He's going to do everything he can to get you to faint, give up, and that's the whole key. You have to win a race. That's the goal, to win a race for your Lord Jesus, for the prize, and you know what the devil is going to try to do is discourage you to get you to quit, to get you to just sit on the sideline and just throw in the towel. Well, basically, the Assyrians were about to attack Judah, so they sent the king of Assyria sent his men in. And when you read the techniques they used to try to discourage the people, it was amazing. And remember, they wanted the people to speak in a different language, but the Assyrian says, no, we want the people to hear. And they began to use atheism. And they began to say, okay, if we're not going to use atheism, how about false inspiration? They said, God told us to come destroy you. And they did everything they could to discourage them. But I want you to see how the devil, he doesn't care whether he uses false inspiration or whether he uses there is no God. Uh, basically, as long as he deceives you and gets you to throw in the towel, that's all he cares about. You'll see this same type of dualism in Daniel 11. Neither shall he, the Antichrist, regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But look at this now. In his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor. So we see this using, uh, of course, the Antichrist is empowered by Satan, and that will be the God of forces. But I want you to see this, this dualism, th this use of materialism, atheism. And then once he has accomplished what he wants to accomplish, he brings in the false religion, you know, and he goes back and forth in history. So we see the devil's schemes. We see what he does. 
Basically, he says, no, no, there is no God. Everything is natural. You don't need God. This whole universe works without God. Just get rid of God. So you have the French Revolution. You know, you have all of these movements in history. And then once he convinces a majority, or, or at least many of the scientists that there is no God, he then brings in this New Age movement of supernaturalism. And I assure you, it says in 2 Timothy, it's not going to be a materialistic world in the last days in the sense that they do not believe in the supernatural Janice and Jambres were able to do uh, satanic wonders they could duplicate most I said most of the miracles that God was Moses was able to do through God's power you can check out Dave Hunt's The Sorcerer's New Apprentice it's a big book but I suggest you get it showing how scientists are now moving away from the old materialism. You have a new world now. It used to be that if you met a scientist, he says, no, I don't believe in God. Nowadays, many of them are saying, oh, yes, I believe in Buddha. I believe in God. I believe in rolling my eyes back in my head. We believe in the supernatural. And uh, this is all setting the stage. What a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So you say, well, why does the devil use materialism uh, I believe he uses it to keep people from getting alarmed about the doctrines that he is bringing them. When he wants to bring the world a new doctrine, he does not want... You've got to remember, the devil's crafty. The devil is the master magician. And what he does is he does not want the people to get alarmed at the occult doctrine, so he must disguise it as science. So the sheeple will embrace it, see. And then once they fully embraced it, then he brings open the curtain and brings in the full measure of occultism. So you see this same pattern in history, materialism and then the full supernatural revelation of the occult. Uh, watch this pattern now. First Thessalonians 5 warns us, Prove all things, sister. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That is our charge. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. This is the thing the devil does not want you to do. And this is the thing that will rock the boat. Is when you find out where the ism or the belief or the Doctrine originated. So, in obedience to our Bible, where did this doctrine of evolution originate? Now, we all know it originated with Satan, but I want to give you some history of the doctrine of evolution. And I figure we'll just start this Gentile New Year uh, right here at the foundation of error or at least a foundation. Uh, most will say that Charles Darwin originated the doctrine of evolution. Charles Darwin wrote a book called On the Origin of Species in 1859. And children, if you're wondering what evolution is, it's basically a bunch of bad people or deceived people saying that your grandma was a monkey or your grandpa was a monkey or your daddy was a monkey. And your daddy's no monkey, is he? No, no. So that's basically what they say. And they say if you give the monkey enough time, he'll turn into a man. And on and on and on. And that's, of course, absurd. We know that you can get a lot of variety by breeding dogs. You can get a lot of change within their kind. The Bible says he created things after their kind. But you're not going to get a cat out of a dog. You're not going to get a dog out of a cat. See? And so that is what we see. We believe in creation. We believe God created everything after its own kind. Well, Charles Darwin came and brought natural selection. And he says everything, if you give it enough time, just evolves and changes. And that's where everything has come from. Darwin did not appear to be a believer, and his wicked book launched the second wave of infidelity. Uh, the second wave of 
atheism and materialism and modernism. But remember we said the devil, the master magician, needed to bring this doctrine of evolution for the world to embrace. And we know how propaganda works. You've got to get the experts, so-called, to embrace it. So he needed the professional men, the scientists, to embrace this doctrine. So he must dress it up in science. He must dress it up with materialism. Oh, no, this has nothing to do with religion. This is science. We don't even believe there is a God. Evolution. We don't need the God of the Bible. But years before Darwin's book, Mormonism was founded. The founders of Mormonism, these are the fellows that you see riding around on the bicycle sometimes, and they dress really nice. They dress a lot better than many Christians dress today. And, uh, but they'll dress nice, and they'll have their hair clean cut, and usually they stay away from soda pop and things like that, and, and they look really, really friendly and kind, but they're deceived. And they'll give you a book, and they say, basically, don't worry about your mind Do you think God will give you wisdom? Of course God will give you wisdom. Why don't you pray for wisdom and go read this book and ask God to give you a sign? And basically they want you to get this burning in your chest and then they come knocking on your door and they say, did you get the sign? And you say, yes, I prayed for wisdom and I started shaking and I got a warm feeling in my chest. And they say, aha, now you know we're true. And then people become Mormons. Is that how we're supposed to decide what truth is? Because you get a feeling? No. So Mormonism was founded by a false prophet who was a Freemason who was into the occult. The Mormon founders were Freemasons, and they got further involved in Masonry. Now, before Darwin's book was written, what did Mormons teach? Here is a sermon from Joseph Smith. Now look up there. It says, Charles Darwin, Origin of the Species, 1859. Now, here is Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism in 1844. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. You have got to learn to be gods yourself, the same as all gods have done before you. So what is he teaching? If God was a man and man is now God, what did he do? He evolved. He progressed. Whatever word you want to use, he's teaching the doctrine that you go higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, see. Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, the second president of the Mormon church. The God that I serve is what? Progressing eternally, and so are his children. Here is this eternal progression. Here is the doctrine of evolution, This is what the devil brought to Eve. You shall be as gods. This was the same view as the occult, pantheistic mystics of former centuries from which masonry was derived. People say, where did this come from? Basically, the Mormons were into the occult. They were into masonry. They were into these occult, mystic, pantheistic doctrines. Here is uh, just one quote from Jacob Beam in 1575 is when he was born in his Aurora. And he says, if I am to make comprehensible the eternal generation, the unfolding or evolution of God out of his own self. So what these mystics taught is that everything is evolving, progressing, and God is evolving, and you basically are a part of God. You need to realize it. I need you to see, people, that evolution was an occult doctrine. It was one of the main pillars. There were two or three main occult foundational pillars. 
And eternal progression was one of them. The law of eternal progression. Now we can explore this further in a later sermon, God willing. And we can also go back to the seeds of evolution that were taught by the ancient pagans. But I'm going to fast forward right now. I just want you to understand that the doctrines of eternal progression were in the air at the time Charles Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of Species. And if they were in the air, who put them in the air, brother? The prince of the power of the air. Look at Ephesians 2. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It was the devil that gave those mystics those doctrines. How did they get them? Jacob Beam would just stare into crystals. Uh, all of these mystics, they were a cult. They used divination. They would just stare into things, stare into water, stare into whatever until they went into a trance. And then they would start writing and start getting these doctrines. The devil gave it to them. One of the scholars who worked on the Old Testament committee for the American Standard Version was Taylor Lewis. And he taught a version of evolution in America before Darwin. Uh, the, the writings of Darwin gave Westcott and Hort mushy feelings. I'm trying to show you that the new versions were founded on people that were evolutionist or friend, friendly toward evolution. Praise God for your King James Bible, right? The Bible says that we ought to stick to the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures, that's inspired. Beware of new Bible versions. Now, <clears throat> here you've got the Mormons, you've got these new version scholars, you've got the occult mystics for centuries, been teaching the law of eternal progression. It's also a fact that Darwin's family were Freemasons, high-ranking Freemasons. Darwin's father was a high-ranking Freemason. They were very rich, wealthy. But occult doctrines cannot take root with a multitude until they are disguised and packaged as science. Now, things can get so bad that one day you'll be able to hand out something with Satan written all over it, witchcraft all over it, and people will embrace it. We're pretty much there already, this Harry Potter generation. It's like, oh, witchcraft? Okay, I'll take it. Oh, Satan? Okay, that's great. But it used to be in former days you had to disguise witchcraft in fairy tales. You needed to teach kids like the Wizard of Oz and all the fairy tales. There's good witches and bad witches. Hey, children, there are no good witches. You understand? There is no good magic. There is no such thing as good magic. It's all from Satan, and it is all evil, and God hates it. It's an abomination to God. Now, but if you want the masses, that, that basically for the children, they get the fairy tales and all the Disney shows for women that basically want to sit back and say, here, watch TV, it's fine, this will be all right. And they sit back and feed it to their children. Uh, that's how you get a generation to embrace witchcraft. But the devil had to bring the doctrines, the occult doctrines of witchcraft, he had to bring them into the mainstream by disguising them as science. That's another tool that he uses. So the occult doctrine of evolution from devil-inspired mystics must be sold as science. Give you another example. Psychology is now embraced in almost every walk of modern life. It used to be that judges and professional people, they asked a pastor or a preacher, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? Nobody cares about a preacher anymore. The modernists said, we're going to bring a day in America where well, nobody will even care what a preacher says unless he has psychologist after his name, unless he's doctor so-and-so psychologist. We're going to replace the church. We're going to replace it with psychologist, scientific. How did they do it? They basically came in and says, oh, well, it's nice you've got the Bible, sir, but we are scientists. Hey, folks, a psychologist is not a scientist unless you define science as meaning just researching anything. And as long as you define science as researching anything, then I guess a psychologist is a scientist. But I'm going to tell you what, it is not a hard science dealing with facts. A psychologist is basically a philosopher, and that's what we've done in America. You have a bunch of philosophers running around. It's worse than that. You have a bunch of occult 
philosophers running around who are into occultism. Their founder was Carl Jung, and Carl Jung was basically had a devil, a spirit guide that he walked with and talked to. He attended seances. He was deep into the occult, and the foundation of modern psychology is occultism. But you can't basically have Jung coming around and saying, oh yes, I have a spirit guide, and we're all into the occult. No, you had to sell it to the colleges of America. You had to sell it to mainstream America as science. See, science. So you think about next time when you see sociologist and psychologist so-and-so, you're like, well, he says so-and-so. Well, basically, that's what the wizard says. A psychologist is a wizard. That's what he is. He is a wizard. He is an occult wizard. Now, you can look at patterns, you can look at what people do, but the foundation of their doctrines, their core foundations are witchcraft. Now, witchcraft itself was also sold as white magic, but it still did not go far enough. It still has that word magic in there, see. Here's a book on white magic. It's not black magic. It's white magic. You know, you can read this. This will be fine. Well, a lot of people embraced it. They said, oh, you're into witchcraft? You're a witch? Oh, come on. It's not the black magic. You know, that's bad. We don't sacrifice things. This is white magic. See, but that did not work. Not as vast as the devil wanted it to work. So he needed to say, New thought, positive thinking, motivational sales techniques, human potential seminar. Take the same witchcraft and now call it motivational techniques. Don't mention the word witch. Don't mention the word magic. Guess what? Americans eat it up. Just take the word magic out of it. They'll eat it. They'll eat it. Positive thinking. I'm just trying to think positive. The devil doesn't care whether you call it science or call it a law of faith. Oh, God has a law. He says, you know, he he has to be bound by these laws. You You can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish as long as you think it hard enough and have faith. It will come to pass. God has to, basically, God created the universe with these laws. He's bound by these laws. So God becomes a genie. See, you can do anything you want, alter reality Call it faith, call it science. The devil doesn't care as long as you embrace it. Now listen to me. When you show an evolutionary scientist that much of what he believes is religious and occultic and came from occult sources, he will react in the same way if you go up to an Alcoholics Anonymous member and show them that their movement was founded by automatic writing And the 12 steps came from demonic inspiration. The founder of AA, basically, he said, something grabbed a hold of my hand, and and through automatic writing, I began to write out the 12 steps. You say, well, what's satanic about the 12 steps? God as you understand him? Is that the God of the Bible? You just invent God as you understand him? Is that the God of the Bible? No, no, no. Whenever you get an impersonal God, not the God of holy revelation, not the God of scriptures, You can bet the devil's behind it, folks. Now, what is an AA person going to do? Most of them, if you go, some of them will be glad to know such a thing. But many of them are going to get very upset. They're going to get very emotional when you show them that they're in a movement that was founded by a devil. Same way if you go to a scientist and show him you're a very religious person, you're a very spiritual person, and you need to understand that the spirits you are following are not of God. You are, and they say, I'm following evolution. I'm, I'm a scientist. Well, you basically adopted an occult teaching of evolution, and that's what you have done. Well, they're going to get very bent out of shape, uh, I assure you. But it's always the same pattern. It's always the same pattern. God is reduced to a mere force, or God as you understand him or it, from think and grow rich to the 12 steps to Jungian psychology. The cherished cherished beliefs of this age have almost all had devilish roots. You read about Napoleon Hill of this Think and Grow Rich movement. He says, I saw spirit guys. They appeared to me in a room, and they all came to me, and they gave me these keys, you know. 
I tell you, it's all having to do with masonry, occultism. You just disguise it, repackage it in a way that modern Americans will embrace. People do not like to hear that the founders of their chosen religions are devil-possessed. It's the same with the prophets of evolutionary science and such like. To hear that Telsa, a, a, a Tesla and some of their other main scientific founders were wizards and sorcerers using divination is just as troubling to them as it would be to a nominal Mormon to hear that Joseph Smith had a peeping stone. How dare you say that about my great founder of my, my religion? Well, show an evolutionary scientist that some of his founders of his great materialistic scientists, uh, a science were simply wizards and they will have the same problems as a Mormon would have when you show him the peeping stone, the occult peeping stone of Joseph Smith. Denial will set in. So let's deal with this wicked doctrine of evolution. And I'm not going to deal with Darwin, though his family were Masons. I'm not going to deal with Darwin since he was only the secondary tool Satan used to sell the doctrine as science. The devil could have used Joseph Smith. He did use Joseph Smith, but only in a limited way. How many people are you going to get to go that route? See, so many will say Joseph Smith is just a nut. He, he's just a satanic, a devil-possessed nut. So you need something a little more polished. See. Let's take the same doctrine that Joseph Smith is teaching. Oh, if we could package it as science, then the devil will realize his goal. Millions will embrace it. Hey, folks, 157, 157 or so years later, almost half of America believes in evolution. Half of America. That is millions and millions of people, not counting the Mormons and others. So I'm sure the number's higher. So let's put aside for the moment the devil-possessed mystics and religious prophets like Joseph Smith that taught evolution before Darwin. I want to look at the founding scientist of evolution. Alfred Russell Wallace, the founder of modern evolution. He died in 1913. He was a British naturalist, explorer, geographer, anthropologist, and biologist. Now, let's fast forward now to 2013 just to show that what I'm saying is not stretched. Here's NPR.org. He helped discover evolution and then became extinct. Alfred Russell Wallace developed some of his most important ideas about natural selection during an eight-year expedition to what was then the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia. So while he was hanging out there with a bunch of witch doctors, this scientist learned evolution. By 1855, now look at that date now, Wallace had come to the conclusion that living things evolve. But he didn't figure out how until one night three years later on the island. So that's 1858. When would Darwin write his book? 1859. When he was ill with a fever on the island, it came to him. Animals evolved by adapting to their environment. As soon as he could, Wallace wrote his theory down in a closely argued eight or nine page paper. He sent that to Darwin. Wallace's letter spurred him to act. The two men published a joint paper in 1858 arguing the theory of evolution and natural selection. The following year, while this man was still on an island somewhere, Darwin published his book on the origin of species and rose to fame. Wallace ultimately faded into obscurity. Now, of course, Satan is ready. He had to use Darwin because he had to sell it as materialistic science. Now... 
that everybody has been primed and is ready for the new age and is ready for the supernatural, he is now bringing back in the real founder of evolution because this age can accept it. See, we're living at a time when people will find out who Russell Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace really is, and they will accept who he is. This age would not object so much to hearing that Wallace, the real founder of modern evolution, was into the occult. He was a spiritist or a necromancer, an occult mesmerist, and so on. So now the story is slowly leaked. Here's 2008 NPR, children. Darwin's theory of evolution or Wallace's. Another Victorian naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, came up with the idea after years of living in the Far East. Wallace actually came up with the idea 20 years earlier, says David Cannon, author of the book, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin. It never seemed to bother Wallace that Darwin received, Darwin received all the credit. No, because he knew what was going on. He knew that Darwin, I believe, was introducing it in a way that he could never introduce it. See. Here's The Guardian, 2013, Alfred Russell Wallace. What, what, what are they doing? Why are they bringing? The, why now? Why now? Because the world is ripe and ready for the wizard. Wallace, the wizard. The world is ready, see. They're ready to find out who the real founder of evolution was. Alfred Russell Wallace, the forgotten man of evolution, gets his moment. Wallace formed the theory of natural selection, but Charles Darwin's connections ensured he got the glory. See, Darwin was rich. Alfred Russell Wallace is far from a household name, but he changed the world. On the remote Indonesian island, Wallace had sent his paper to Darwin to help get it published. 2006, David Wool, The Driving Forces of Evolution, says in 1855... He published a short paper expressing the idea that species are related by descent. In 1858, while lying in his hut, feverish with malaria, there suddenly flashed upon my mind the idea of survival of the fittest. The same evening, he wrote his manuscript and sent it to Darwin. There are some books out today that maintain that Darwin blatantly plagiarized Wallace. Whatever the case, Darwin certainly rushed to publish his book while Wallace was far away on an island somewhere. Uh, let's go to 1916 from Alfred Russell Wallace's own pen. No, no, this is actually uh, a writer about Russell Wallace from 1916. Wallace lived to see the theory of evolution applied to the life history of the earth and the starry firmament, sister, to the development of nations and races, to the progress of mind, morals, and religion, even to the origin of consciousness and life, a conception which has completely revolutionized man's attitude toward himself and the world and God. It is a foundation, is it not? It's a foundation for just about all that's bad. It's a foundation for Nazism. It's a foundation for abortion. It's a foundation for, for the so-called sexual revolution. It's a foundation for everything that's bad. Evolution became intelligible in the light of that idea which came to him in his hut and changed the face of the universe. Now, here's what I'm going to say. Wallace the wizard certainly is a historical fact that he attended black magic rituals way off in these tropical islands. And in the midst of these devilish superstitions all around him, while sick with malaria, he supposedly gets this idea like a flash of light flashing into his mind. Now some will no doubt argue that simply attending a so-called black magic ritual and getting an idea come into your mind when you have a fever does not necessarily imply satanic inspiration. And I'll give you that. Though I don't suggest you go and attend a black magic ritual. You understand my point. But let's just give them that. They say, oh, he was just investigating it. 
So let us take a look at this man. Years before he ever took his trip to the tropicals, before he ever attended black magic rituals way out on some island, before he supposedly formulated the doctrine of evolution, let's take a look at him before and then after he formulated the doctrine. So let's go back to the man's early 20s. Now we're hearing from the man himself, Alfred Russell Wallace. On Miracles and Modern Spiritualism, 1875. Modern spiritualism is necromancy. Modern spiritualism is spiritism. It's the belief that your Aunt Betsy, who's dead, can communicate to you if you have a seance. Wicked, wicked stuff because they're not hearing from their aunts or grandmamas. They're hearing from devils. Devil. That's what spiritualism is. Spiritualism. So listen, the founder of evolution wrote a book called On Miracles and Modern Spiritualism. Now he's going to tell you something about his life when he was in his early 20s. My earliest experiences on any of these matters, that is matters concerning necromancy, treated of in this little work was in 1844. Aha. So you were getting into this stuff before you learned the doctrine of evolution. Some of the elder boys tried to mesmerize the younger ones and succeeded. That's occultism, hypnotism, divination. I myself found several who, under my influence, exhibited many of the most curious phenomena we had witnessed at the lecture. So he attended a lecture with a famous uh, mesmerist, and he began to come under the sway of this famous hypnotist, and began to learn how to do these things himself. He says, I was intensely interested in the subject and pursued it with ardor, carrying out a number of experiments to guard against deception and to test the nature of the influence. He learned how to, when they're in a trance, lift up their eyelids and look at the eyeball. He learned how to do tests where the person didn't know what they were doing. He would actually have them, uh, he would put them in a trance, and have a, a, a little boy hold up a chair with his arm, uh, a heavy, heavy chair, and just sit there while he went over to his desk and studied while the fellow's sitting there holding the chair. And uh, he basically saw things that were not physically possible. Um, and as a so-called scientist, he did all of these so-called tests, and he says, I'm absolutely convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that this was not by suggestion. And he lists all of the proofs, pages and pages and pages of why it was no way it was suggestion. Uh, he believes it was supernatural. He says, carrying out a number of experiments to guard against deception and to test the nature of the influence. Many of the details of these experiments are now stamped as visi vividly on my memory as they were events of yesterday. I produced the trance state in two or three boys and could always be sure that it was genuine. He goes on to say, in my life, Alfred Russell Wallace, it was at Leicester that I was first introduced to the subject which I had at that time never heard of, but which has played an important part in my mental growth, psychical research. So psychical research was a fancy word for necromancy, divination, talking to the dead, as it is now termed. So this man admits that this played an important part in his mental growth. This uh, divination played an important part in his mental growth, as it is now termed. Sometime in 1844, Mr. Spencer Hall, Spencer Timothy Hall, gave some lectures on mesmerism illustrated by experiments, which I, as well as a few of the older boys, attended. I'm going to tell you something, children. If anybody ever wants to play around with hypnotism or seances, or anything, Ouija board, anything that's occult, you run, you get out of there, you leave, and you say, I want nothing to do with that, you're wicked. Which I, as well as a few of the older boys, attended. I was greatly interested and astonished at the phenomena exhibited. He also showed us how to distinguish between the genuine mesmeric trance and any attempt to imitate it. This led me to try myself in the privacy of my own room, and I succeeded after one or two attempts in mesmerizing three boys who would at once answer any questions or do anything I told them. 
In this state, they could do things which they could not and certainly would not have done in their normal state. But perhaps the most interesting group of phenomena to me were those termed phrenomismerism. Having my patient in the trance, at that time lectures on this subject were frequent. We took every opportunity of attending these lectures and witnessing as many experiments as possible. Folks, Wallace was not just immersing himself, was not just investigating. He had become a hypnotist. He had obtained skill at entrancing people. Wallace had become a wizard. In fact, him and his brother would find orphans running around on the street that knew nothing about suggestion, knew nothing about hypnotism. And he would say, hey, kid, come here. And then they would hypnotize them, put a spell on them, and get them to do all kinds of crazy things. This is the founder of evolution. So after this time, he goes away, attends a bunch of black magic rituals on tropical islands, and supposedly has evolution come to him. Darwin steals it from him, or jumps the gun on him, whatever the case. Evolution now is brought to the scientific community, Wallace is still seen as the expert behind the scenes. Darwin is the person who's going to use scientific language and feed it to the world. But Darwin always would write him letters, call him my dear Wallace, and I'm glad you never got mad at me. You know, uh, you're so smart, and really, anytime I have a question, I come to you. Uh, I'm so glad you never felt bitter about what happened. And I, I mean, all these letters, I've read the personal letters from Darwin to, to this man. Uh, now let's look at what happened after 1875 on Miracles and Modern Spiritualism. Wallace says, we have now come to the consideration of what is more especially termed modern spiritualism. The spiritualists, beyond a doubt, are in the track that has led to all advancement in physical science. Yeah, their science... Their science, I believe he's correct. Their opponents are the representatives of those who have striven against progress. Yes, their progress. Compare it with that of attraction. Suppose a person wholly new to both subjects. He is to choose between two assertions, one true and one false. And he's to lose his life if he chooses the false one. The first assertion is that there are incorporeal intelligences in the universe and that they sometimes communicate with men. The second is that the particles of the stars in the Milky Way give infinitesimal permanent pulls to the particles of our earth. I suppose that most men among those who have all existing prepossessions would feel rather puzzled to know which they would have chosen had they been situated as above described. In other words, which one would you believe to be the most crazy? Uh, uh, which one would you believe to be the most true, I'm sorry, uh, if your life depended on it? He's saying what I'm trying to tell you here about spirits being able to talk to you is no more crazier than anything else you've ever believed. He's trying to get scientists to embrace it. We have now to consider whether this vast array of phenomena which claim to put us into communication with beings who have passed into another phase of existence teaches us anything which may make us wiser and better men. I myself believe that it does and shall endeavor as briefly as possible to set forth what the doctrines of modern spiritualism really are. Notice this now, pay attention, which has led to the establishment of a new religion. He's about to tell you what the doctrines that are coming from all of these so-called ghosts. The main doctrines of this religion are, this is what all the so-called spirits, and they are spirits, they're evil spirits, they're not people's dead grandmother, they are evil spirits that the Bible warns you about and says in the last days they will follow doctrines of devils. Here is one of the main doctrines, that after death, man's spirit survives, gifted with new powers. Is that true for everybody? Is that true for everybody? No. There's a judgment. After death comes the what? The judgment. But see, they want to get rid of the judgment, brother. So you know the devils. They participated in these seances, and he's basically summing up. Basically, from attending all of these seances, here's what the spirits tell us. That after death, your spirit survives. So they don't want you to fear. See, they don't want you to go to church, become a Christian, get right. They say, you don't got to worry about that. 
The spirits tell us that on the other side, everybody is free. You become a spirit with powers. He commences from that moment a course of apparently endless progression. So what do these devils come? They tell you the same thing that they were telling the mystics, Jacob Beam and others, that, hey, you are evolving. Neither punishments nor rewards are meted out by an external power. Aha. Uh-huh. What did the devil say to Eve? Thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not surely die. There's no punishment. There's no reward. It's all karma. Now, here again, we have a striking supplement to the doctrines of modern science. He says, notice, see how evolution is coming from the, the, the ghosts? The organic world has been carried on to a high state of development by the grand law of survival of the fittest. In the spiritual world, it's the law of the progression of the fittest which takes its place. There is for all an eternal progress. There are no evil spirits. Orlando, is that true? There are no evil spirits? Oh, there are evil spirits, are there not? Well, what does he say? He says, you know what we're getting from the ghosts? You know what we're getting from seances? You know what we're getting? We're getting eternal progression. We're getting the doctrine that the Mormons gave us. He's saying, we're getting the same doctrine I already gave you nuts a long time ago. I'm the father of it. And I've already given you this. Now I'm telling you, it's the same doctrine that the ghosts are giving us. Life in the higher spheres has beauties and pleasures of which we have no conception. Oh, take eat, says Satan. And you'll be as gods. You shall not surely die. Every statement I have made is derived from those despised sources, the wrapping table, the writing hand, or the entranced speaker. I subjoin a few extracts from one of the most gifted trance mediums, Miss Emma Hardinge. She says, All these are there, chained by their own passions and the slavery of hopeless criminal desires, hovering around those who attract them as magnets. Remember that another point of the spiritual doctrine is the universal teaching of eternal progress. She says nobody, even somebody that's bad, even in the other world, if they're bad here in this life, in the other world, they're still progressing. Everybody is progressing. Everybody is evolving. Wallace says that while he was in the tropics, he would hear about the spiritism explosion in America. He says he couldn't wait to get off the island so he could go investigate. And in 1865, he attended his first seance, supposedly. Well, Mr. Wallace had already been into magic and witchcraft and occultism long before he ever attended a seance. He tells us again, we have now to explain the theory of human nature more or less explicitly taught by the communications which purport to come from spirits. What do the spirits teach? They teach man is a duality, evolved. Progressive evolution of the intellectual and moral nature is the destiny of individuals. Wow! So Wallace pretty much passed off the scene. He invents evolution, gives it to Darwin. Darwin packages it in a scientific way in a materialistic way, in a way that Wallace did not entirely agree with, Wallace says, Darwin, you've got to put the supernatural in there. You've got to have a supernatural force that makes this stuff happen. And Darwin and his friend says, no, no, we can't put a supernatural force in this thing. we, we just got to keep it naturalistic and materialistic. Well, now the devil's ready to put the force back in it, brother. That's why Wallace is now being introduced again to the world. So he pretty much fades off the scene. Uh, He gets embroiled in the Bedford Canal controversy uh, and other things like that. But for the most part, he fades off the scene. But the world is now primed and ready for Wallace and his brand of evolution. What's the difference between him and Darwin? Wallace believed in what's called intelligent evolution. There is a higher power behind it. There is a God of forces that are behind it. There are spirits or aliens or something behind it that is, that, that is edging it on, that, that is responsible for man's intelligence. He believed the body developed by evolution, but the spirit by some force. Here's Michael Flannery. 
He's the author of Arthur Russell Wallace, A Rediscovered Life in 2012. He says it now appears that Wallace's was the more forward-looking theory, the more scientific view. Ah, so now the scientists, these authors are starting to realize that Wallace was actually far ahead of Darwin. In other words, there are gods out there that we can become. Evolution or the eternal progress of the occult mystics and masons and Mormons is now baked and ready to come out of the oven for the scientist. Basically, you are witnessing before your eyes scientists embracing Mormonism. Scientists embracing more of the occultism that they've already been drinking from and didn't know it. Here is... Uh, Back to 1916, Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace never maintained that this earth alone in the whole universe is the abode of life. Wallace did not hesitate to express his own firm conviction that science and spiritualism were in many ways closely akin. He believed that the near future would show the strong tendencies of scientists to become more religious or spiritual. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Go look at the great... Nobel Prize winning physicist of the early 20th century. And they all sit in a room and they start saying scientific method. Okay, I hypothesize. I perform my test. And then I prove it, true or false. And they said, prove it, true or false. Prove it, true or false. Proof. What is proof? And all of a sudden they got chills and they realized... Wait a second. Everything can't be material. Everything can't be material. Even my scientific method is based upon proof, and I've never stuck proof in a test tube. I mean, so, so basically they either become Buddhist or they started believing in God, and, and you had this vast change where even Charles Potter, who started the first humanist church in America before he died, was investigating the occult and psychical ESP and research. So what you have, Sorcerer's New Apprentice, you have the scientist turning back to the supernatural in fulfillment of the prophecy of Janis and Jambres in the last days. You're not going to have a bunch of atheists and materialists. You're going to have wizards, wizards opposing us, wizards opposing the truth. And Russell said, uh, uh, Mr. Wallace said, Oh, in the near future, you're going to see them all embracing me, basically, is what he's saying. Let's take a look. Francis Crick, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, says aliens in a rocket brought spores to Earth to seed our evolution. Ah, Robert Jastrow, leading NASA astrophysicist. He's dead now, died in 2008. He's NASA's first president of the Commission of Lunar Exploration, head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He says scientists have no proof that life was not the result of an act of creation. You know what? He says things like that, and Christians went crazy. Yay for Jastro! Wait a second. Wait a second, Christian. Christianity Today, we've got to interview Jastro. Tell us, Jastro. So in Christianity Today, he says, that there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. So all the Christians are high-fiving one another, and, well, this is great, this is great. They, oh, hold on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You've got to understand. All the scientists are doing is they're saying, oh, yes, we believe in God, a God of forces. We believe in the impersonal Star, Star Wars God. We believe... Sagan goes on to say, God was probably an astronaut. He probably came down in, an, in, a, in a rocket and landed on Earth and put an egg here. And the egg began to evolve. The alien egg. And if you think that's uh, stretching things, Carl Sagan said the Big Bang came from a cosmic egg. Cosmic egg. Who put the egg here? Mr. Sagan? An alien laid it, a big chicken, a chicken alien. A big chicken alien laid an egg, and that's where you came from. Of course you came from a chicken. A chicken in a rocket. 
Now you've got Hollywood movies everywhere. Movie after movie after movie. Earth seeded by aliens. Earth seeded by aliens. Now when the Pope comes and says, oh yes, we believe in evolution, theistic evolution, what are they saying? They say, basically, there's a God of forces and there's this higher intelligence that we all believe in and that's what evolution is powered by, the force. Wow. So let me give you some quick conclusions or applications of my sermon for this new year. This is what I want you to understand, children. I want you to understand that evolution, this idea that we evolved from monkeys, came from a wizard. Okay? I want you to understand that. It came from a wizard. Who gave it to Wallace? The devil did. Because you shouldn't play with hypnotism. You shouldn't play with black magic. You shouldn't play with seances. The devil gave it to that man. The God of our Bible is not an impersonal force. He is our creator. He wants a relationship with you. He wants fellowship with you. He wants you to talk to Him in the morning. He wants you to talk to Him during the day. He wants you to pray to Him, depend upon Him, cast your cares upon Him. He is God, the creator, our Savior, our Lord, and our judge. See, they want an impersonal force. They want that God as they understand Him. They want that AA God. They want all those other gods that came from automatic writing. So number one, God is not an impersonal force. Number two, there is a devil. They want you to not believe that there is a devil. They do not want you to believe that there's evil spirits. Oh, come and investigate. You don't have to worry. There's no punishment. There's no judgment. There's no accountability. And three, my final point to you today is this. You are at the door of all the devil's schemes for 6,000 years coming to final fruition. What an amazing time to live in, Brother Nathan. What an amazing time. I mean, what he planned back there in the days of Genesis, as he's been watching the unfolding of God's plan. And, you know, it's right there at the beginning. What was his plan? I will exalt myself above the stars of heaven. I mean, what is, what is the devil going to do? Tower of Babel. The devil has a goal that you can be as gods and the aliens are going to help you because the aliens are just further evolved than we are. And here it is. It's all coming together. So you say, what's, my, what's, your, what's your main point? I want you to know God this year, folks. I want you to know the personal God and not know Him by some tickle behind your ear not knowing by some burning bosom, I want you to get in that book and let God speak to you in that book. I want you to read that Bible and hear what God has to say to you. And the Bible says if a man will read that Bible morning and evening and hear from his God, God will prosper him. God will prosper him. God will bless you. God will bless you with true blessings. See. He'll teach you the fear of the Lord and the secret things that you need. Have a relationship with God this year. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior if you haven't done so. But for every believer, let's walk with the Lord. Pray to Him. Rely upon Him. Love Him. Be sad if you grieve Him. Be afraid to grieve Him. Jesus said the times right before the tribulation period are going to be dangerous. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And he said when the tribulation period comes, if it were possible, even the, even the elect could be deceived. It's going to be so bad. This thing, this thing is satanic, Brother Orlando. I mean, it looks good. 
The devil comes an angel of light. I mean, he has packaged this thing. He has packaged it. You could take whatever you want to call it, positive thinking Christianity, name it and claim it. You want to call it science. Whatever brand you want to call it, he gives you the package, shiny. I told you that Carl Jung, the founder of psychology, had a spirit guide and attended seances and was also looking for the coming of the Antichrist. Carl Jung says the names of Wallace and many other eminent men symbolize the rebirth and rehabilitation of the belief in spirits. Basically, Carl Jung said, he's my hero. Wallace is my hero. See, Jung was way before his time. They had to keep all this stuff about Jung undercover. But now, when the New Age movement is in full swing, we can start learning about Wallace, see. But Star Wars and... Wallace is the new hero. He, he not only founded evolution, he believed in a god of forces behind it. Star Wars. First Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh, there's more. There is more. But let's just let that digest a little bit. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God, that you've given us a Bible. We thank you for the warning, Lord, to go to the source and make sure that a doctrine has come from your scriptures, Lord. Lord, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices, his schemes. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you've given us the word of truth. Father, I do pray that you'll bless everyone who hears this sermon with greater diligence this year. With a thirst for you, Lord with a hunger to pray. Let families, Lord, please, eat together, pray together. Let no Christian get discouraged. Lord, I thank you for the song that you gave us about the man who said, my feet almost slipped until I thought of the children. What his fall would do to others. Oh Lord, may we not be selfish. May we think of you. May we think of your feelings. May we think of the feelings of the children. May we think of the Christian growth of these young people. God, help us reprove these wicked occult doctrines and have no fellowship with them, Lord. May we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Revive us, God. Revive these young people. Give them revival, dear Lord. I pray they'll be stirred up for you, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.